this um, building is almost exactly 100 years old. It's 101 years old now. A very fine old building called the Wyoming, from the great days of the fin de siècle uh, gentleman's apartment building in Washington. And this apartment, which wraps around the whole of the top floor, was originally built with this wonderful flooring that you can see, this wooden floor, which is well, it's almost like an ice rig. That's why I don't have any furniture, because I like sort of just rolling around it. Um, by, the, by the architect of the building himself, for his own occupation. And I think that the great distinction of this apartment while I've been in it was that it was used by Clint Eastwood to film Absolute Power. Actually, one of his less good movies. It, it's about an art thief in Washington, D.C. who needs a safe house. And the presidential motorcade goes up Connecticut Avenue. We often hear it uh, somewhere central. And I uh, came back, having lent the apartment to the movie makers to find that all these walls were covered with uh, knockoff paintings of the treasures of the National Gallery that the Clint Eastwood character had stolen. And I was really hoping that the producer would let me keep them, but he had to take them all away. My hood could be described, and maybe a realtor would want to describe it as Calorama because it sounds pricier, but actually I think Calorama is the other side of Connecticut Avenue. It's what we call Embassy Row. Diplomatic buildings, residences, woods, gardens, very beautiful, pretty costly. Then if you break to the right out of my front door and go along Columbia Road, you come to Adams Morgan, sometimes called Madam's Organ, to indicate that it's our sort of Bohemia, our Latin Quarter, our little West Village, if you want. So diplomacy on one side, um, Guatemalan music, um, Ethiopian restaurants, etc. on the other side, and then down Connecticut Avenue, straight to DuPont Circle, bookstores, cafes, restaurants, perhaps three Starbucks. So what you're seeing behind me is a sort of confluence of, of Washington, D.C., our nation's great capital. That's Connecticut Avenue, this north-south artery that runs, in effect, from the White House up to Maryland, crosses Massachusetts Avenue a bit lower down at DuPont Circle. That's the sort of radial axis of the city, you might say. Due west there is California Street. And this is Columbia Road curving around to uh, Adams Morgan District. There's the Russian trade mission. Um, I'm told that there is still a, an apartment in this building run by the National Security Agency to monitor the goings on there from the days of the old uh, Soviet Union. You probably can't see it behind me, but um, on the horizon is the Russian compound. And those domes you see in the woods are the um, Naval Observatory buildings on the grounds of which, of course, lives the Vice President. And then you see the British Embassy just in front of that, which is the extreme west end of Massachusetts Avenue, Embassy Row. So it's a, it's a, a good reminder of the small size and centrality of the District of Columbia. And then there in the middle on his horse is General McClellan, uh, President Lincoln's worst general the man from, from whom he at one point asked to borrow the army since the general appeared to have no use for it and probably was a defeatist. He, he certainly ran against Lincoln later as a, a pro-slavery Democrat and may have had secret sympathies with the other side. It makes me laugh anyway because on his horse he's still pointing south in the wrong direction. The Confederates would have been that way. He's riding away from them. Um, ah, a little reminder of, of, uh, of our history. A typical writing day for me depends on how atypical the previous day was in that I tend to work late at night and if it's been successful I may not have gone to bed till three so the next writing day will probably not start till say noon or so on but if, it were, if you absolutely had to average a day it would be like this um, get up try and inhale some coffee forcing myself to eat oatmeal for cholesterol purposes or anti-cholesterol purposes blah blah before lunchtime, I wouldn't get much done except answering emails um, and fending off whatever had you know, accumulated. Um, the world of telegrams and anger, as Ian Forster puts it, just coping with that. And then having lunch, which I usually do reading by myself, because I think the essential thing for being a writer is being a good reader. The main thing, as I keep saying, never tire of saying, is, is to keep testing yourself against other writers who are better than you. That's what qualifies one as a writer, I think, is permanently running the risk of having to say, I don't know why I bother. I think there are certain authors of whom one should have, you know, all 
all their books, even if you can go and borrow them from the library. Um, so I, I know I have in this, in this uh, apartment every single word George Orwell ever wrote, for example, including his expenses reports to the BBC. The lot. Everything's ever been published by him anyway. Um, most of uh, Marcel Proust, um, most of James Joyce, not all of P.G. Woodhouse, because actually I have to say that there, there are some books of his that aren't that worth keeping. It seems almost blasphemous to say that, but, I, but the cream of Woodhouse, I thought. Evelyn Waugh, um, Karl Marx, Leon Trotsky, um, Nabokov. It's a bit eclectic, as you see. Salman Rushdie, Martin and King's Amos, Ian McEwan. I have pretty much all of what they've written. I would, I like to think that I have a life rather than a job or than a career. And it's all to do with reading and writing. The only two things I was ever any good at. And public speaking, which I can also do. And that's how I make my living. But it's, it's also what I am, who I am, what I love. Um, and fortunate at that because there's nothing else I can do. It's not as if I could have been a lawyer or a doctor and I chose this, it chose me.